Hello and welcome to our Wednesday evening video. We are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 29 through 31 for the lesson in just a minute. Uh, and that will be after we do a song. Let me give you, uh, I think the only announcement that is pertinent right now is for uh, this Sunday. It is Communion Sunday, so we hope that uh, everyone who is available can be here for that and be preparing for that. Uh, I have a song to uh, play for you. It is from this last Sunday, our church family sang All Things. Uh, it's a song that we have been learning over the last couple of months, and it speaks about God's sovereign purposes in our lives, and how he's doing all things for his glory and for our good. Uh, so uh, the sound was pretty much just picking up me and my guitar on Sunday, so I've added a little, added a little bit of effects to try to bring in uh, some of the other voices and instruments. So it's not perfect, but uh, I'm not so overwhelming on the video. So I hope that you are blessed. The song is called All Things. I encourage you to listen to it and even sing along. Here it is. When my heart, when my heart was cold and lifeless, and I wandered in my blindness, you pursued. that was a blessing to you. We are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 29 through 31 for our study. The temporary nature of the world and the significance of Jesus's return shape how we order our lives now. I don't know that you can see the whole title as I'm looking at the screen. Uh, the little sub window of me is on top of the word word order. So uh, let me repeat the title. The temporary nature of the world and the significance of Jesus' return shape how we order our lives now. You can see the uh, outline in front of you. I failed to do the tabs like I should, but we are on number three, uh, and that is about virgins, and that would be the betrothed. And then Paul talked about that specifically. Singleness is preferable but not required. But then he's uh, moving in now. Uh, to his reasons that he encourages that, and really it has to do with uh, 
uh, how short our time is and the seriousness of living in these, what is called the last days since Jesus's ascension. So specifically, we're in verses 29 through 31. In verses 25 through 28, Paul has addressed different circumstances people would be in related to marriage and encouraged the Corinthians to stay as they are. Now, remember, he didn't say that that is absolutely necessary. Marriage is good. It's in God's design. It is just his feeling that because of the way the times are, uh, you stay as you are so that you can devote yourself to kingdom work, to the Great Commission, to uh, all of the things that uh, are related to the urgency um, in the context of Jesus's return. In verses 29 through 31, he explains that this appeal is because of the gravity of the times and how we must take this seriously in how we order our lives. So this really matters to all of us. And just we, as we think about what our priorities are, uh, what we treasure, uh, where we put too much emphasis, uh, things we hold on to dearly, things like that. So let me read the verses, going back to verse 25 so we can get the context. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. And really that last sentence is kind of really why he's saying what he's saying. Because of the urgency of the times to be able to have a singular focus and devotion to the things of the Lord like he did is a wonderful thing. But obviously he understands and leaves room for wherever God leads anyone in relation to marriage. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. Okay, those are the verses. Let's look at a couple specific, uh, the, the sp um, you know what, I have lost the screen that I need for our uh, initial questions. So I'll just have to read it to you, okay? Verses are right there in front of you. Typically, we have our initial observation, thoughts, or questions about the passage. Uh, and then secondly, how you would briefly describe the passage, and apparently I have lost that slide. So how would you describe the passage? Here's what I have. The form of this world is passing away, and the time of Jesus' return grows shorter, so we must prioritize our lives accordingly. Let me say that again since it's not on the screen. The form of this world is passing away, and the time of Jesus' return grows shorter, so we must prioritize our lives accordingly. Okay, so then let's look at the specific verses what does Paul mean in verse 29 when he says that the appointed time has grown short? Verse 29, he says, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. Jesus has come. He's provided salvation and now reigns at the Father's right hand, awaiting his return. So everything that happens after that nears the end when he will return. This was true when Paul wrote this. We call that Jesus, the imminence of Jesus' return, and is true now. And obviously, we look at, at our culture and think Jesus' return has to be close. And Christians have probably said those same things for the whole, uh, the whole of church history. And so that may be true, and it may not be true. But all of church history, since Jesus' death, life, death, resurrection, ascension, has been these last times with an urgency in the imminence of Jesus's return. So how is this his basis for his appeal? Jesus could return any time, and this is of surpassing importance. So take seriously where God has you now, whatever it is. Where we've been before, if you're married, take, seri take it seriously, but then not as seriously as you take living for the Lord. Uh, I say not as seriously, but I think you understand. Uh, if you're single, whatever situation you're in, understand that we think of those things in the context of the shortness of the days and the nearness of Jesus' return. Letter B. 
From the rest of verse 29 through the first part of verse 31, Paul lists five examples of living paradoxically in light of the appointed time of Jesus's return. I think you can understand why I say paradoxically when I look at the verses again. Uh, from now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejo rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. So you can kind of see the upside downness of all of Paul's five examples there. What is his primary point overall? And then what are some specific implications? So his primary point, I believe, Elsewhere, Paul affirms the gifts of God we have in this world and appreciating and enjoying them rightly, whether the subject is marriage, possessions, or enjoying life. And so not just in 1 Corinthians, but in all of Paul's epistles, he certainly does talk about those things, that marriage is good, God's given it as a gift, you are to enjoy it. Um, he's already said in 1 Corinthians 7, not to keep your spouse from their conjugal rights. Um you know, uh, he talks uh, in other places about possessions or enjoying life. And so he's not saying don't do those things. What he is emphasizing here is the temporary nature of life in this world. And that's why he gives the upside downness in these five examples. So we can't seek ultimate joy or significance in any of these things because our significance is in Jesus. And when he returns, these things in significance will be fully seen. We have to interpret all these things in light of the surpassing worth of Jesus now and when he returns, okay? And so in all of these examples, we, we look at them and live in them with the, the, the weight of the priority in the um, shortness of the days and the significance of Jesus's return, and it surpasses anything. And so what are some specific implications? We can't live as if our ultimate joy and satisfaction come from our spouse. Marriage isn't permanent. So we must seek our ultimate joy in our relationship with Jesus and prioritize now accordingly. Uh, and then in his other examples, uh, every joy and sorrow is temporary. We will experience fullness of joy in the age to come, but not now. And that then orders when we rejoice, how we look at rejoicing, how we look at mourning or suffering. This applies to possessions as well, the things that we have or think we should have. Uh, they're temporary. And so all of these things have to be viewed through the lens of what Paul's talking about here, the urgency of the days and the imminence of the return of Jesus. This applies to possessions as well and how much we treasure the world and its things. So the whole world and system, everything else. We can't focus on any of these things to the point of forgetting the magnitude of what will happen when Jesus returns. And so, even though Paul is maintaining his context here that he has been in in all of chapter 7, there's a real significance of this just for all of our lives that we're thinking about priorities and laying up treasures in heaven rather than things on, on earth where moth and rust corrupt things and the thief breaks through and steals. Uh, really important about prioritizing how we view things and how we live, even down to the very roots of the most fundamental human relationship, which is marriage. And how does the last part of verse 31 provide emphasis? Paul says in the last part of verse 31, for the present form of this world is passing away. He essentially, <coughs> excuse me, he essentially repeats how he started verse 29 when he said the appointed time has grown very short. Everything we experience in the world in its present form is coming to an end. And so we have to take seriously all that the Lord has given us that translates to the age to come. And that is uh, living in light of Jesus's kingdom with him as our king, um, discipling our children uh, and, and loving others. And so that uh, does apply to the church family and then your spouse. OK, and so a lot of things are in both categories. And so we approach them correctly. But what translates to the age to come and what doesn't? And then therefore, when we understand what doesn't, we may view it differently. Lastly, how does this passage point us to Jesus? And how can we live in his grace in the context of it? First of all, the primary emphasis in the passage is the return of Jesus. He doesn't exactly say it, but he says the appointed time has grown very short. That's exactly what he means. And therefore, how his value and what we will experience in eternity shapes how we think and live now. 
okay, his surpassing worth, what we will experience in eternity that affects the way we think of relationships and possessions in the world and mourning and rejoicing and everything else now. And so we live oppositely, as he's talking about in the passage, because our focus is not on those things. It is on the shortness of the days and the appointed time when Jesus will return, which is growing very short. And then secondly, Jesus's grace enables us to continue to comprehend more fully how he is better now. He's better when we rejoice. He's better when we suffer. He's better than our spouse. He's better than this world. He's better than possessions. And our joy and satisfaction are in him and how when he does, all he will do in the end, that's his return and then making the new heavens and the new earth, finally punishing sin, all of these things, everything we think is ultimate now will be seen for what it truly is. And that is a guarantee from scripture. And it is surpassing of any way I could describe it. But as much as is possible through the power of, this, of the Holy Spirit and through the enabling grace of Jesus and his surpassing value, let us look at these things that Paul has mentioned in light of his motivating basis. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope this is an encouragement and a challenge to you. I'm going to change screens here and take a few minutes to pray. I'm going to take a minute to pray uh, with whoever is watching the video. Let me give you a couple of new requests that aren't in our bulletin. I think everyone on the prayer chain uh, this last week uh, saw that Autumn Woodbury is, uh, has been accepted to the Job Corps. And then Brooke, Trudy's other daughter, is doing better in her pregnancy. So we want to be praying, rejoicing in praying for both of those things. And uh, then I don't think anybody, um, I mean, I think I'll hold that one. Not off because I'm not sure I've talked to the person uh, who to whom it applies. So I better not put it on the video yet. But uh, uh, I think that's the main one that I wanted to let everyone know about. The ones that are on the bulletin still, you can keep praying for those. Uh, for our fishermen, especially, they'll be uh, making their way back within the next few weeks uh, as we are beginning August. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you for the fact that Jesus is indeed of surpassing value and we need nothing else besides him. But thank you that you've given us these gifts in life that are, are, are for our good, such as our spouses and possessions. And uh, as we navigate life, rejoicing and sorrow and just all of these things. But I pray that we will look at them rightly in light of the shortness of the days and the imminence of your son's return when he will make all things new and we will rejoice in him eternally. Uh, please bless all of the requests that are on our people's hearts, whatever they are. Uh, I, uh, those that are on the bulletin, the continuing ones, uh, and especially just want to pray for Autumn as she heads to Job Corps, and then Brooke as she continues with her pregnancy that's had some complications. Thank you that she's doing better. Just all the other needs that are in our church for Barbara as she continues to recover, for Lee as she continues to kind of uh, figure out what life looks like now without Tom. Um, just all the other ones. We give those to you, and I pray that your power will be uh, upon our church family, um, the ones who are here for the summer, the ones who aren't. I do pray for our fishermen as they are coming back in the next weeks. May these last couple weeks be a good time for them in every way, and I pray for all the things that are going on this Sunday. May your name be glorified. May we treasure Jesus more. In his name, amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. It's been my pleasure to get back with you, as always, for the Wednesday video. As always, if you have any prayer requests or need anything else, please let me know. And I hope to see everyone this Sunday. Goodbye.